So uh, Mike has been coaching for uh, upwards of 20 years. Let's, let's go with that. Um, and he is recently uh, a certified pro Kanban trainer. And uh, Mike and I are both here to talk about some of the ideas behind pro Kanban um, and the Kanban guide that they recently published. So um, I'll hand it over to Mike to kick it off, I think, and we'll go from there. Sure. Okay. Are you going to be sharing? Uh, the screen uh, or would you like me to? I can share if you want. Okay. So in a nutshell, let's start off what is pro Kanban? Uh, because there are in fact two different communities around Kanban right now. They both started in the common place. They both started with a project at Corbis back in 20, 2006, I think. Six, yeah. Yeah, 2006, um, which in turn had been based on something that had gone on at Microsoft previously, but it really wasn't the Kanban that we know today until it hit Corvus. What had been going on at Microsoft had been something quite different, but they took some of those ideas and they, they turned it into something uh, more like what we today consider to be Kanban. It, that in turn is based on what came out of Toyota's automotive manufacturing years and years ago, but how we approach Kanban for knowledge work is again, quite different from what Toyota had been doing. Uh, so if we look at what's up on the, the board, um, Kanban, the, the uh, little notes at the very bottom right um, is in fact a Kanban card from Toyota's automotive, automotive manufacturing. So what is a Kanban? It is a signpost or a card of some kind that indicates information. And what we've got up in the top, sorry, the bottom right is an actual Kanban card from Toyota. Now, as it got applied to knowledge work, it changed a little bit, it morphed, and we'll talk about how that is and then how it split into the two things that I was talking about a moment ago. The coffee cup up above that is actually my preferred uh, example, uh, probably more because I'm a coffee lover, but it really is a, a great example of a Kanban because when you come into Starbucks in this case, I'm more a Tim Hortons guy. I can say that to the Buffalo crowd. Um, but you come into Starbucks and you want to order you placed your order and they print it up and they put it on the side of the card, or in some cases they write it on the side of the card. And now that information, that Kanban then moves down to the next station. And so the person there goes and starts to fill it out and perhaps that person passes it to another person, but all of the information that you needed to track that was on the Kanban. And so when you get to the end, before you drink your beverage, you're welcome to pull that sticker off, although that would be difficult, I would think, to peel it off. But you could and get rid of that bin because now you have the final product and you don't need the Kanban anymore. The Kanban was there for the assembly purpose, for putting it together. Toyota used this in their systems where they would put these physical pieces of paper and they would move around with the parts in the warehouse. And so they would provide information that would go on to the next area so people would know when it was time to reorder stock and when different things happened at different times. So that's where Kanban came from in the manufacturing context. Back to 2006 at Corbis, they were taking the ideas out of that and they tried to switch it over to knowledge work. And they came up with the notion of what we see today of you know boards where stuff moves from left to right and you've got whip limits and all of those sorts of things. And they started to figure that all out. And then that's sort of where the community split a little bit. Uh, David Anderson went off and created Kanban University and he built up this big thing of all of the different community that's going on. And there's been a lot of good thinking on that side. But more recently, the pro Kanban side, coming from many of the same people that were at Corbis, um, has gone in a different direction. And whereas the, the Kanban University model is all about how can we sat, provide an answer for everybody about everything? And here's this huge monolithic thing that is Kanban. The pro Kanban people said, let's just strip it down to its essence. What is the bare minimum that is Kanban? What are those things that if you're not doing these, you truly can't say you're doing it? Whereas the Kanban University model, you have to pick and choose, and it's really hard to know what you need and what you don't because it's become this, this monster. Pro Kanban says these are the bare minimum things. And that's what the Kanban guide is that we're going to talk about tonight. It's the documentation for that bare minimum. What are those things you have to be doing to say you're doing Kanban? And it includes a bunch of uh, concrete uh, steps, core practices that you have to do. It includes some measurements. There's certain things that if you aren't doing these things, you truly can't say you're Kanban. So that's where it comes from. I, I like the simplistic model. Let's look at the, the most essential. What are those things that are universally true about it? And so that's why I've gone on the pro Kanban side. And as Kevin mentioned, I am a trainer for them now. 
but that's the essence of where it is. So what you're seeing up on the screen is my rendition of the, the Kanban guide, because I tend to be very visual. And even though the Kanban guide is, is small, it's only about 16 pages, much like the Scrum guide, it's very wordy. And so as I was going through and trying to figure out, well, this thing here maps back to something that was three pages earlier. And as I'm going back and forth through the guide, I drew this picture out and I find this a lot more useful. So now you have two different ways to look at the data. You can either read the guide or you can look at my summary of the guide. Either way, it's all the same information. So we've got three core practices. Oh, okay. Are we going back to the... Uh, no, I'm, I'm back. not sure which way we're going on the diagram. I'm back at the core practices. Okay, back at the core practices. Perfect. Um, but actually, perhaps we should talk a little bit of the theory first, just to make the level set, to make sure that everybody's talking about the same thing. Because I'm talking as if you already know the Kanban University model and what are the differences. Let's just level set and get some of the basics of Kanban out of the way. And then we'll come back to what specifically the guide says. So I like to talk about the Kanban base about flow specifically in terms of a highway. And the reason I like to talk about it as a highway is that we all instinctively understand highways. We've all driven on one. We all understand how they work. We can look at a highway and say, oh, I see how things are moving. I understand those things because it's, it's part of our culture. It's become intuitive. So if we look at this picture here, if we look at the two lanes, the lane going away from us and the lane coming towards us, we can ignore the one going across the top. But if we look at the, the two coming and going, um, which of those two lanes do you think is going faster? The one, other, the one going away. The one going away. And we guess that because of how the cars are spaced. Um, it, it's entirely possible that somebody, you know, ask everybody to stop. They took a picture and then they got them moving again. There's nothing that we can tell. It's not a video. But we can infer based on the positioning of the cars and how many cars are in there, that the right side is probably moving faster than the left side. Um, same thing for the, the, next, the next point, which is uh, more cars getting to their destination per unit of time. So over the next half hour, which lane is gonna get more cars to their destination? We can probably guess again that it's the right side because it's moving faster, right? And very subjectively, where are the happier drivers? Now, I don't know about any of you, but I'm happier when the car is actually moving and not when it's stopped on the highway. So happier drivers are probably on the right side. Well, then let's looking at some of the other things. How about, how about utilization? How about how many, which side has made better use of the pavement, has packed more cars onto that pavement, so we're getting better use of it? Left. The left, because really, is it a good use of the pavement when the cars are that far apart? Really, when we're looking at utilization of pavement, truly that left side is much better because we've got far more cars on them. Um, and then who's got cars, more cars on the road for longer? And again, that, I think that's fairly obvious. That's the left side. And I want to call out these attributes because it, this is how we define a couple of terms and the terms are really important. On the left side, we are highly utilized. We've really made good use of that pavement. On the right side, we have higher effectiveness. We're actually getting cars to their destination. And it matters what, which two terms we use because which one we measure, we're gonna get more of. We've all had that manager who comes around and says, you don't look busy enough. I'm gonna give you more to do, right? That's utilization. That's somebody who's totally focused on measuring utilization. You don't look busy enough. I'm gonna give you something more to do as opposed to how can we get stuff delivered faster? How can we get stuff into the hands of our customers faster? That would be effectiveness. And which one you measure makes a difference once the system gets loaded. So if this highway was empty, and this highway never gets empty, this is up in Toronto, it never gets empty. But if it, if, if it was starting from an empty point and we started to pile cars onto it, it didn't, doesn't matter what we're measuring because adding more cars improves both of them. So if there's only three cars on the road and I add a fourth or a fifth, utilization goes up and effectiveness goes up, right? But we get to a certain point, and in the case of a highway, it's about 60% capacity. We're adding more cars, makes utilization go up and effectiveness go down. 
So as we add more cars past that point, the highway gets slower and slower and it takes longer to get people to the destination. So this is a really important point. We wanna make sure that we're measuring the right thing. Uh, and everything in what we're talking about here is aimed at improving our effectiveness, not our utilization. Okay, over to the next one. We'll go really quick on this one. Highway 405 in LA widened at the cost of $1.6 billion. So the question is, was it a good investment? How did it affect utilization and how did it affect util effectiveness? You tell me, based on that picture. Not very effective. How about utilization? Uh, yeah, maybe utilization went up. I think utilization went up. It's great. We've got far more cars packed on that pavement. What a great use of $1.6 billion. But cars are not getting to their destination any faster than before, right? In fact, if anything, we've probably slowed them down because we optimized the wrong piece of the flow. We optimized how many fit on the highway and not how many can get off the highway or get to their destination. Okay, so let's move across to the next one. This is the math behind it. Again, not gonna spend a ton of time on this. This is the Kingman's formula that any kind of a queuing system will have some point at which we reach that tipping point. And on this particular one, it's about 90% in a highway, it's gonna be about 60. But the point is that once we exceed that curve, once we get past that round, part, adding more utilization makes effectiveness drop really quickly. And we can see this in everything from call center wait times to highways to the kind of knowledge work that we do. Every queuing system has this kind of a curve. And so we want to keep all of our traffic, our flow at a lower utilization than the curve. So on the left of the curve. So how would we do that in the case of a highway? We would do that on the next slide. Now, I've never seen one of these in Buffalo, but I have seen them in lots of other cities. These are actual stoplights leading up to the highway. So we're trying to reduce the number of cars on the highway, keeping the utilization low so that we keep effectiveness high. So by reducing the number of cars on the highway, we keep the highway moving smoothly. It also gives people more options because if I can see that the on-ramp is packed with people backed up at the stoplight, I can choose to go in a different direction. Once I'm on the highway, I have no options. I'm locked, I'm blocked, can't get off again. Not for a while. And okay. So. I, I just wanna um, sort of call back to what, what we're getting at here, right? And the, the analogy, right, of the highway and, and limiting the number of people on the highway is that we want slack time, right? We, want, we, we don't want everyone to be highly utilized, right? We want to make sure that people are effective. Um, so I, I just wanna sort of explicitly call that out we want to be effective in delivering value to our customers. We don't want to be highly utilized and make sure that we're always busy all the time. And those two things become at odds with each other as you get to, to a certain level of utilization. And that level is, is different based on the type of work that the team is doing and, and the type of dependencies that they have and all of that stuff. But there's a level where, where if we break that level of utilization, we're gonna become significantly less effective very quickly. And so all the things that are in the guide are aimed at optimizing for this effectiveness and also for two other things that we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so, um, the ambulance, we don't need to spend a ton of time on. We just need to recognize that we, sometimes we have expedited work. And when that ambulance comes on the highway, everybody else has to pull over to the side. So the ambulance gets through, it gets to its destination, but it slows everybody else down. And when there's one ambulance a week that crosses the highway, it's not a big deal. But if every third car was an ambulance, nobody would be getting to their destination. So and think about the impact that expedited work has to your workflow. And this is gonna be critical. So as we're measuring effectiveness and efficiency and predictability, all those things go out the window when we start getting expedited items coming through. So we're trying to optimize for those things and this expedited work just throws it all out of whack. So we want to minimize that as much as possible. And I, I don't have a picture for this, but we, we can see this in real life when a, when a motorcade comes by or something, right? When the, the presidential motorcade comes by, everyone else has to stop, right? As that, as that motorcade comes through or, or significantly slow down depending on the, the size of the highway. But um, 
that that's what happens when expedited work comes through, right? It slows everything else down. So we have to understand that impact of, of expediting our work, right? Okay, so now to the next row down. So normally uh, in this session, we, we go into a simulation right now, a feature bond simulation. Um, and feature bond is a tool. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to run us through a simulation later if anyone wants to see it, um, but it's a tool to simulate Kanban, right? To simulate what it feels like to be in a Kanban system and to flow work through that system. Um, so we're not gonna run that simulation in the middle of the session right now, um, but I'm happy to run this later if people want to see it. But I will call out the biggest lesson that everybody gets from that is that everybody says, I didn't realize what an impact WIP had to my effectiveness. That's the big takeaway. Everybody says, I didn't realize that allowing WIP to grow and grow was going to mess up my effectiveness so much. Because that's utilization. Utilization goes up, effectiveness goes down. That's your WIP. Oh, yeah, you don't look busy enough. Put more on the queue. Increase that WIP. That's utilization mindset. And that messes with everything else. Okay, so moving down. So here we go, we're back to the, the individual pieces in the, the Kanban guide. And so we start off with three practices and all of those practices have ripple effects. They all go off to other things, which is what he's sort of covered up, but not quite. So the three core practices are define and visualize your workflow, uh, actively manage the items in your workflow and optimize your workflow. Now, if you're familiar with the, the Kanban University model, of how you do things. They have six core practices, not three, but those six map two for one down to the three. So there's really no difference between the two other than the pro Kanban model says, here's three simple things and the Kanban university pulled them out into six. And in some cases, pulling them out actually made sense and in a couple of cases it didn't, to my mind. Um, for example, they separated out feedback loops from improving well, why would you have a feedback loop if you didn't want to improve? So anyway, so we have those three things and all three of them are critical. So we define and visualize our workflow. Um, the visualization step, I mean, if you've done any kind of Kanban, this is obvious. We are such highly visual creatures. Half of our brain mass is devoted to image processing. So we are so visual. If we can get things visually displayed, we can start to manage it more effectively. And then defining the workflow, there, there's a certain elements to defining and the pro Kanban model calls out in the Kanban guide. So every time I say pro Kanban model, I'm really talking about what's written in the, the Kanban guide. So they, they define very specific things. These are the things you must define in your workflow. And it's things like, what are the items that flow through your team? How are you managing WIP? Uh, what are the explicit policies to get you from state to state through the board? So it's got a bunch of very explicit things. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to those in a moment. I guess that's why Kevin covered up those other things. So let's move our way down to the next picture. So here we are. So we've got, we've all seen a board that looks something like this. Uh, this is a very simplistic Kanban board. You can get very complicated with some of these things, um, assuming that you have a tool that supports that. If you're just doing cards on a wall or on a mural board, it's easy to do really interesting things with your layout. If you're stuck in a tool like Jira, you're limited by what the tool is capable of doing. Um, so we've got all kinds of work items that are flowing through here. We have a whole bunch of columns that represent states in your workflow. Um, what's, you'll notice that I deliberately label them A, B, and C because I, it used to be when I was teaching Kanban that I would put labels of here's real columns that I've seen in the past. And then people would walk away and say, this is what the columns must be called. They must be called coding and testing and this. And no, that's not my point. The point is they have to be unique to your team. There may not be three, there might be 20. I've never seen a, a table with 20 columns, but it could be possible. I've, I have seen team, uh, tables, boards like this with 13, 14 columns in them. But, and that's not that uncommon. There's one uh, one other thing I want to call out that's sort of a distinction between the pro the pro Kanban model and the the LKU model. For those of you that are familiar with the LKU model, um, 
so the the LKU model pretty explicitly says that we sh you should start where you are and then evolve, right? When we get to improve, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but the workflow that you visualize in the LKU model is your current workflow. They say that you should visualize the way you currently work. The pro Kanban model doesn't expect that. And, and the stories that I've heard from, from what Corbis did and from other effective Kanban teams um, say that, you know, you should inspect your process. You should understand where you are today. But the process that you put in place doesn't need to match it, right? Doesn't, doesn't need to just mirror what you're already doing. Uh, it should be whatever makes sense, right? With, as you inspect your process, as you understand uh, how, what your workflow looks like today, define a workflow that makes sense for your team, right? And, and make it as effective as you can, given whatever information you have today. Um, sometimes these changes are revolutionary, right? We can't always evolve to um, the place that we wanna be, or it doesn't make sense to evolve to the way, place we wanna be. And we need to take that revolutionary standpoint and be courageous enough to do it. Now, the, the subtle caveat that goes with that is that the surest way to fail is to make your board too aspirational. We see all kinds of teams who say, oh, well, we should be doing these five things every time, and we should be doing this, and we should be doing that. And then they lay it all out on the board. And of course, they never do those things because they never intended to do those things. They just thought it would be a good idea if they had. So they made it so aspirational that there was no way they ever followed it. And that's a really sure way to fire, to fail. Yeah. So we want to be careful that, yeah, we don't have to start exactly where we are today, but it should be pretty close to where we are today. Not too much of a leap to get to the new, the new model. Was it part of the uh, intention of start with where you are uh, to make people think about all of the steps in their process and where the information goes and where the dependencies are. And you see all these pictures of just a giant spaghetti thrown on the wall. But mm -hmm. once they start looking at it, it's like, oh my gosh, we do all of this. And it's like, yeah, then you start paring it down. But most people don't even know what they're doing. That's Currently, absolutely true. So many different places. Yeah, mapping out the value stream is often an eye opener. For, for big companies. You map it all out. No, 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 this is truly what your model currently is today. And people are, are you crazy? Why would we go back and forth three times in this area? Well, that's what you do today. Should we fix it? Yeah, so, so inspecting that process is a, is a really important part of it, right? You need to understand what that process is. And I think that that might have been the original intention of that statement of start with where you are. Um, the, what, I, what I've seen implemented is, um, is, is, a, is a refusal to take those revolutionary leaps, right? And to jump to whatever that, that next leap is. And there's certain mandatory things here that we have to do, that we have to change, that you can't say, well, we're starting where we are if we're mandated, mandated to start implementing to manage our WIP, because that's not where we were. Right. So there's certain things that we have to do right off the bat. Just let's not make it too aspirational. Let's start to something relatively close to where we were. And then we'll move forward from there. OK, so definitional workflow, it's the what are the individual units of value that move through the team? Um, you know, so what what do we have? Do we have bugs? Do we have new feature requests? Do we have production incidents? Uh, for a new product team, it might be as simple as that. Those are the three different types of work that come through the team. Um, I worked not that long ago, uh, not that far from where you are, uh, with a team that when we modeled out what they were doing, had over 90 distinct types of work that flowed through the team, nine zero. And sure, a lot of them were simple and a lot of them just fit on some kind of a ready doing done board, but it was 90 distinct and different types of work that came to this team. And so modeling that out was, was quite an eye-opening exercise. They had no idea that they did that many different things. So okay. we want to model it all out. What are the individual items of work that flow through the team? Um, one important note to make here is that these things must be valuable to someone outside of your team. They, they have to be pieces of value that your team is producing, not just the, the tasks that they do. Um, if, if you model out the tasks that the team does, then you end up optimizing for utilization, right? Optimizing to stay busy with those tasks rather than optimizing for effectiveness 
of, of delivering value. And this is actually a point that Kevin and I are a little bit different from the guide. The guide just says must be valuable. And we like to add valuable to somebody outside the team because that helps clarify it. Because I could make an argument that refactoring my code to make it prettier is valuable. And it is valuable to me, but it's not valuable to anybody outside the team. And so that's where we like to draw the line and say, it's not valuable unless somebody outside the team cares about it. And we're not saying that you shouldn't do those things, right? You, you most definitely should be refactoring your code. You most definitely should be doing all of these keep the lights on type activities, but they're not what we're trying to optimize, right? We're trying to optimize for value and refactoring is something that will help us improve our delivery of value, we hope, right? So when I have a question here, yeah, yeah. when you're when you're defining the workflows, because we have several in ours, do we do you try to create that visual to um, so that all work goes through that same those same columns, you know the columns that you define, or is it a subset? Well, it, we, we want all of the work to flow through some board. The question is, how many boards do you have? The most complex oh. team environment I've seen had seven seven boards for one team. Oh, uh, and maybe. So we're actually, I think we're, I, we might be, um, we have one board, and but we have several workflows. So based on the work, for each workflow, we should have a board. Well, it's up to you how you choose to model it. I would probably model them on separate boards. Okay. So as, as we walk through the, the other steps of, of this, uh, of what exists in Kanban, um, it might become more clear why we're visualizing these things and why we, why we think that that's important. And what you're visualizing is going to be, is going to be based on how can we accomplish that value, right? How can we, how, how, what do we need to visualize in order to improve our workflow? Um, so in your case, maybe you do need separate boards for each of those different work item types, or maybe it's good enough to have a simpler workflow and, and that will, that, that supports all of those different work item types. Um, it really is, is context dependent, but it's what are you going to need in order to improve your workflow? Okay. So the, the, we have to give you the consultant's answer. It depends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, do you Go want ahead. me to jump in? Oh, no, I thought somebody was going to say something. No. The, uh, the next point, you're welcome to talk if you wish, uh, is timings. You want to, you yeah. want to cover this one? So, so this uh, is, we, we have to define when work is started and when work is finished in our workflow. Um, so your, your workflow will likely have multiple started and finished points um, where you say, you know, this is started from the customer's perspective at this point. It started from some other perspective at this point and from some other perspective at this point and similar with the finished perspective, right? Um, what we really want to visualize though is, is that that big piece of value, right? When, when did we start working on this piece of value? And when did we deliver that piece of value? Um, so the most important ones are the, are the ones that are as far out in your process as you can, you can find, right? Um, and, and this is really it, right? When, when do you consider this work started and when do you consider this work finished? Hopefully finished is in production and started is at some point that we're making a commitment to our customer to work on this stuff, to do this stuff. Um, one or more defined states, right? That's what we were talking about with the columns in the workflow. So we, we just need to have at least one column in your workflow and potentially multiple columns. Um, any work item that has been started and has not yet passed that finished point is considered work in progress, right? That is your whip. Um, and I'm gonna just jump over to this board just so I can sort of show these things a little bit. Um, so this is your start point, right? It's when something moves into ready in this case. Um, or it's just when you consider that work started, and then this is the end point. And anything in between those two lines is your whip. Um, you need to define how you're going to control your whip, 
right? Um, so the typical way to do that is by adding whip limits to each column, right? We, we limit whip by saying we will only have X number of things active in column A, Y number of things in column B, et cetera. Um, but there's all kinds of different ways that you could do that. You could limit whip by person. You could limit whip by, uh, by swim lane. If you have swim lanes, you could limit whip in any way you want. The, the important thing here is that there can't be any uncontrolled whip. So all whip needs to be controlled in some way. Um, you can't have a, a column where you can just pile things in there. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. If I could point out an interesting subtle thing here is that the Kanban guide here talks about controlling whip, whereas the KU model, Kanban University, talks about limiting work in progress. And there's a subtle, it's a really subtle point, but I think it's interesting. And in that normally the best way to optimize for effectiveness is to reduce the amount of work in progress, generally. But sometimes we find that for us to get maximum effectiveness, we have to ensure that a certain column also has a minimum. So maybe column B on our diagram, we're not that effective unless we have a buffer in there of always at least three items. So if we're just blindly saying work must be limited, it doesn't account for that. But by saying that WIP must be controlled or managed, that does. So it's subtle, but I think it's an important point. Um, John, did you have a question? Did you guys mention, um, I know this is about the, the least amount that we need to be doing to, be, to call it Kanban. Um, did you guys like take out like cycle time or lead time? I saw cycle time, but is there also lead time or did that get stri stripped away? This model deliberately doesn't distinguish between cycle and lead time. Yes, they are different. They are different things. Lead time is more customer centric and, and cycle time is more uh, operational centric. But the guide doesn't care. The guide said there's a start point and there's an end point, and we're just going to call it cycle time. Got it. Sorry. Yeah, the perspective. Well, it's a good clarification. Because uh, we asked the same question. We said, why is it not talking about lead time? Yeah, what the perspective that Pro Kanban takes on that is that lead time is a special case of cycle time, right? Uh, lead time is, is cycle time, where the start point of that cycle time is when your customer asked for it. And the end point is when it's delivered to your customer. Um, so they, they just see it as a, a uh, sort of special case of cycle time. And that's where they call out that you can have multiple started or finished points. Um, and you want to measure cycle time between all of those different uh, started and finished points to gain different types of insights. Great. Thank you. Yep. Um, What's next? Uh, explicit policies about how work can flow from each state, uh, flow, flow through the board, right? So you have to define your rules about what, what needs to be true for something to move into rank, what needs to be true for something to move into column A, um, what, what needs to be true for something to go into the expedited swim lane or, or whatever swim lane you're talking about. So just rules about how work is, is moving around in this workflow in different ways. Um, there, there are some base rules that are sort of already defined in Kanban, like you won't violate your, your WIP expectations, right? That's, a, that's one ver, uh, special case of an explicit policy that is common across all teams, and that's why they call it out separately. Um, and finally, a service level expectation. So this is a forecast of how long it will take for work to flow through your system. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how to calculate a, a service level expectation later, I think. Um, but this is this is just an I, this is a uh, a commitment that you know we expect work to take X number of days to flow through our process. It's wording terminology, it's not actually a commitment; it's an expectation. Yes, yes. because this is we can say with eighty five percent certainty the work will be done in four days. Because that means that historically, 85% of our work got done in four days. And so that's all we're saying. We're just making this expectation. They very deliberately don't use the word service level agreement because an SLA typically has penalties that goes with it. If you don't abide by this, there's some kind of a financial penalty that goes along. And there is none of that. This is just, we, we can say with 85% certainty, it'll be done in four days. 
So then we can do interesting things like in stand up, we can say, well, 85% of our work's done in four days. This piece of work is already at six days. Maybe it needs to boost in priority. Maybe we need to focus more on that one in order to get it done because it's already exceeded the SLE. Okay, so that was defining and visualizing. Go ahead. Uh, are we going to show Lucy here? We have time. Uh, it's been about a half hour, maybe. Maybe skip. Okay. Yeah. Let, let, let's talk just about the, uh, the the stand up here. This is not specifically in the guide, but it's worth calling out because stand ups are done so poorly, so universally. Um, Almost every team that we go into is doing status updates and they're talking about, you know, this is what I did yesterday of what I'm doing tomorrow. Even the scrum guide doesn't say do that anymore. I don't know if you knew that, but the 2020 scrum guide has removed those questions because they were detrimental. So now we, we talk about other things. So talking about how we flow our work through the system, we want to talk from oldest to youngest. Why oldest? Because we want to focus on those things that are nearing their SLE the cars off the road as fast as possible. And that means taking the ones that are closest to their destination and moving them before we move the ones behind them. So we're always trying to do that, working from oldest to youngest. Now, most tools like Jira or whatever tool you happen to be using, they don't tell you the age of the ticket on the, on the ticket. Jira actually shows you how old it is, how long it's been in a specific column, but that's not the same as how long it's been on the board. So we want to go from oldest to youngest. And if the tool doesn't tell us what's oldest, then we can infer that by saying things further to the right are older than things further to the left. Things higher in a column are older than things lower in a column. Therefore, if we walk in this sequence from right to left, then we can start to see what's going on. So we start off, we look at the done column. There's typically nothing to be said about done. Sometimes somebody wants to call out hooray for us, we, we ship this thing, but done is typically not something we actually care about. So then we move on to the next column. We look at the top. It's going to be in one of three statuses. It's either actively in progress, we're doing something with it, in which case we'll ask questions about, you know, what will it, what's left in this work? What will it take to get it to done today? What, what can we do to move this along? Would it help if somebody helped you with that? So all of this, these things around, it's in progress. What can we do to get it to move faster? But it might not be in progress. It might be blocked. Well, if it's blocked, again, coming back to the core practices, we need to actively manage the work in progress. That's, that's core practice number two. Actively managing doesn't mean, oh, we look at it and say, oh, it's blocked. Too bad. Move on. No, we get it unblocked. That's actively managing the work. We get it unblocked, we get it moving. So what can we as a team do to get this work unblocked? Um, and then there's a third possible status. It might not be in progress. It might not be blocked. It might just be sitting idle because nobody has time to work on it. And if we've only got one of these, it's not that big a deal. But I find that about once a year, I run across a team that has easily 10 times as many tickets on their board as they have people in the team. So a team that that Kevin and Jeff might know uh, had over uh, 10 people in the team and over hundred tickets on the board. You know that 80 of those tickets were sitting idle. They weren't blocked, but nobody had time to work on them because they'd been started and everybody else is busy with other stuff. So when you have a lot of things that are in that, that idle state that's just waiting, that's a real problem. Again, one or two we're not concerned about. So this is, it's a really quick discussion. What's left on this work? What can we do to move forward? Can we, would it help if somebody helps you? Or if it's, if it's blocked, can we get it unblocked? Oh, it's just idle. Well, what's up with that? Why is it idle? Because other things were a priority. Now we move on to the next one. This should be a really good top of the next column. So we start at the top, we work our way down. And again, we ask all the same thing. What's left on this work? Would it help if somebody helped you with that? What will it take to get it unblocked? Asking all these questions, it goes, I'm taking a lot of time to talk my way through it, but really this goes very fast when we're doing it with a team. If your standup is taking more than a minute per person on a regular basis, then we're probably talking too much. 
and we're not focusing on the real work that needs to get done. The key here is core practice number two, actively managing the items in the workflow. If we're not active, if we just watch them passively and say, oh yeah, there's another one. Oh, look at that one. That one got finished, but that one didn't. Then we're not doing our job, actively managing. I can't stress that one enough because when a team fails with Kanban, more often than not, this is why. They didn't actively manage the work. And so we go through all the items one at a time all the way until we get back to your first your to-do column. And at that point, we're probably done. There may be things we need to talk about in the to-do or the ready column. There might be something that has a date on it that has to be done by Friday and we haven't started it yet. But typically there's nothing we care about talking about in there. But again, it's actively managing the work. What do we do to get this moving faster? Uh, you'll notice the big X through status updates. We really, really don't want status updates. Because that's what makes the meeting go on. When you, when you get a stand-up that's running for half an hour, it's because everybody's getting status updates. Everybody's making up stuff because they don't want to sound like they didn't do anything yesterday. And I, I often tell teams that, you know, I, and it's a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, I don't care what you did yesterday. I care what you're going to do today. Right. It, it doesn't matter to me anymore what you did yesterday. Let's talk about what we're doing today going forward. Right. That tends to uh, help stop the status updates. All righty, so now we get down to improving the workflow and there's two pieces to that. The first piece is we need to take some measurements and there are four mandatory measurements that we have to take. And then we have to try and optimize things based on three uh, pieces, which are effectiveness, efficiency, and predictability. But we'll get to them in a moment. First, we need the measurements. So there's four of them and they're pretty simple. So we need to be measuring work in progress. I have 20 things in progress today. This doesn't say that we have to measure them by column, that we have to measure them by person. It just says, if you don't know how many work items you have in progress, then you're probably not actively managing things. So we need to measure our work in progress. How many things are actually in progress? If we go to the top right, then we're looking at throughput. Well, how many items actually got completed in this period of time? So we did 20 things last week. We did 20 things the week before that. It's just throughput. It's number of items completed, over a fixed period of time. A week is a really common period of time, but it could be over a day, it could be over an hour if you're a help desk and you're, you're just spinning through work really quickly. Uh, then we go down to cycle time and cycle time is just that time in days. I started it today and I finished it today, it's a one. I started it yesterday and I finished it today, it's a two. Really simple math, we're not looking for anything complex here. And then the last one, which is potentially the most interesting one from an actively managing the workflow perspective is this is work that's been started but not finished yet. How long has it been open? Because we measure all the cycle time and sometimes we forget about the fact that although our cycle time is generally three days, we've got this one item that's been open for a hundred days already. Because Kevin and I, when we look at data from teams that we coach, we would see, oh, here's an outlier at 100 days. Oh, here's another one. We saw one a couple of months ago at 400 days because people just started it and forgot about it. Or it got blocked and nobody cared enough to unblock it. But most likely because they just forgot about it. Because they weren't talking about it every day, they just forgot that it was even there. And the next thing you know, you're at 400 days it's been sitting there. So uh, work item age. Like oh, your, uh, your microphone is rubbing a little oh, bit. Um, thank you. Work item age, just to, to call this out, I think this is the most valuable metric for actively managing your workflow. Um, this, is the, this is the key factor in saying, which things do I need to address? Which things do I need to make an active decision on how I'm going to change the way that we're addressing them, right? If, as Mike described, right, if something is, getting higher than your service level expectation, or if it's nearing your service level expectation, and you don't think you're gonna be able to finish it uh, in, in, your, in your forecasted time, then that's a place to have a conversation. Should we uh, maybe swarm on this thing? Should we, uh, do we have to go and remove blockers? Do we need to go have conversations with people to remove those blockers? Um, or maybe we need to split that work and, and find a way to deliver 
um, some smaller piece of value that keep that 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 helps our customers uh, sooner than than it would otherwise be delivered. But work item age is the is the critical factor to being able to have those conversations. You need that in order to be able to understand which items need active management the most. Um, so there, there are some groupings to this. You'll notice that the two items on the left are both related to things that have started but not finished yet. The two on the right are related to things that have finished. The two at the top are all aggregate values. We're measuring groups of items. And the two at the bottom are individual items. And then we come back to here where we go and we look at the three things that we are optimizing for, which is effectiveness, efficiency, and predictability. And it would be awesome if we could only optimize for one thing, but the truth is it's always a balancing act. There's three things we're trying to optimize for. So effectiveness is giving the customers what they want when they want it. Are we actually delivering things to the customer in a reasonable way? Uh, efficiency is all about how efficient are we at actually getting the work done? Do we get things through quickly? Do we get things through with the right level of quality or are they coming back for rework all the time? What is it that we can do to actually get that pipeline to be more efficient? It's not about what value got delivered, which is effectiveness. It's all about getting the value out to the customers because we could be delivering good value, but if we can't get it to them efficiently, that doesn't really help and vice versa. And the last one is predictability. It's a very reasonable question when management comes to us and says, when will it be done? That's a very reasonable question, but we don't wanna be giving big estimates, You know, put our finger in the air. Oh, I think the wind is blowing this way. Therefore, no, we wanna be able to come up with a number that's realistic. And it turns out that using probabilistic forecasting, uh, we can get really accurate numbers to that very question of when will it be done? But how accurate our numbers are will be based on how predictable we've made the system. So if we find that you know, some item for the, a similar size piece of work, sometimes we get it done in three days and sometimes we get it done in 17 days, then it's not gonna be very predictable. It's gonna be very hard to figure out how long it's gonna to take to get anything because we have huge variation in our items. Um, or if we have varying skill sets and we're not able to handle uh, the, the load of things. We don't have all the right skills on the team or not enough of the right skills on the team. The data becomes highly unpredictable. So as we are optimizing, we want to optimize for effectiveness and efficiency, but we also want to optimize for predictability, for making that data predictable so that we can answer the question when it comes, when will you be done? Because it's the rare team where people don't care about that. There are some. I mean, sometimes we've got teams that are doing just production support. And they don't care how many months it's going to take to get this batch of production support items done. They only care about what it's going to take to get today's items done. But most of the time, if we're doing product development or anything like that, they're going to say, you've got these hundred items. How long is it going to take? How much money do I have to throw at this problem? And we need to be able to have accurate answers for that. That's a bonus. I'm not sure if we, yeah, if, I'm happy to go through that if we have, uh, if people have time and want to, but let us move down to the last slide. Uh, so prokanban.org has all of the information. Do we, is there a URL there for the Kanban guide? Uh, no, I'll add it. Okay, Kevin will add one directly to the guide. Uh, Prokanban is the organization behind the guide but they're on different URLs, different, different domains. Um, shameless plug, I am teaching a, a Kanban class that goes into the same kind of material we did today, but much deeper uh, over a two day period. And that is coming up later this month. So that is the only shameless plug that you're, you're gonna get. Um, Yeah. Questions, thoughts, surprises. 
rent. Yeah, Mike, I got a, a question um, on that previous slide, um, cycle time and then work um, age items. Yes. I'm, uh, to me, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just been a long day, but to me, those seem the same. Well, the difference is that age is before it's finished and cycle time is after it's finished. So age is, we started it last, we started it three months ago and it's still not finished. So we can track the age. Um, but cycle time is we, we know exactly when it started and when it end and that we're measuring the days between. So lead so, time would be, would that be synonymous with lead time then? Or is that? Well, the cycle time and lead time are basically the same kind of measurement. Okay, it. It's okay. from a designated start to a designated end. But in both cases, you know the end. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Work Thank item you. age, you don't know the end yet. It hasn't ended. Yep. Okay. Thank you. That, that clears that up. Mike or Kevin, I have yeah, a question yeah. about WIP limits. Uh, when when uh, teams are experimenting with adjusting their, their workflow, I mean, one of the things that they always gravitate towards first is like their WIP limits. And they, they seem to try to manipulate those to solve the problem instead of like really digging down deeper, which is a separate issue altogether. My question is, as a starting uh, point for setting WIP limits in order to start uh, Kanban implementation and, and start running experimentation behind what works for them. Is there a recommended number? Like I've typically seen X plus one where X is the size of the team. Um, my criticism of that is it allows for some waste in the system. I've seen X minus one, but that one may artificially force collaboration where it's not needed. Is there any sort of uh, guidance you can offer on that? Yes. Um, the, there's a couple of things that we go through. So first of all, we ask what's typical in that column. So we look at, you know, if, if the work has already been flowing through, what's if it's normal on a typical day to have three items, maybe we'll make it a little bit bigger. Maybe we'll make it a four because I don't want them to hit the whip limit right away. So if they have some general sense of what's typical in that column, we make it as close as possible to typical. If we have no idea, this is a brand new team. We've never had any work flow through or if the type of work has changed. So we were doing one type of work and now we're doing something radically different. And so we have no idea where the limit should be. Then you might want to say, well, we've got eight people on the team. So maybe we'll have a limit of eight across all the columns. That's not eight per column. That's eight spread across the columns. Um, if we know that the team is going to be collaborating a lot, doing a lot of pair programming, doing things like that, we'll make it less than the number of people on the team. If we know that the work that's coming in is likely to get blocked a lot, because we anticipate that most of the work that comes in will get blocked for some period of time and we'll have to start a new thing, then maybe I'll do double the number of, of tickets as there were people on the team. So there's just a couple of heuristics that I have, but I'm trying to find what is the smallest number I can get away with to start off with. And then we measure from there. I noticed, and, you, had, I noticed you had a separate swim lane for the emergency work. Is that to mitigate impacting the, the, the normal workflow work in progress? No, that's to make it more visible, to make it really, really obvious. This is why ambulance have uh, sirens on top. All right, so then We're trying to make it really, really obvious so that nobody has any questions about what takes priority. Perfect, so those are, those are included when you're looking at your whip. Yes. Okay. Although expedited typically has a rule that says we allow the whip limit to go up by one if there's an expedited item in okay. that column. Perfect, thank you. Mike and Kevin, two two quick quick things. First of all, I'm um, just a bit of feedback. This is the worst PowerPoint deck I think I've ever seen. Um, so 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 that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is uh, there was a question earlier that I'd love if you could loop back to because I'm really curious uh, when you talked about having multiple boards and being then able to see all of the work. And sometimes it's it seems to me like if if I was doing this on a physical board. I could just put different tape markers and be able to see all of my work. And technically it's one board. And if I was using a piece of software like lean kit or something that nobody uses because it was stupid expensive, but I could do that. Like I could have multiple workflows in a single. And I think one of the challenges that I suspect I see with, with teams is that they use stupid tools like Jira, for example, or other ones where you're forced to put everything into a single workflow or create other boards to hide all of the work. 
And I'm wondering if you can talk in your experience about ways you've dealt with that, ways you've been able to um, deal with with sort of those constraints that are imposed by the tool that's being used. Yeah, I, th I think you described that in a really good way when you said that uh, we we add additional boards to hide the work. Um, that's often what happens, right? That's not the intention, right? Our intention is to make everything as visible as possible. Um, but often what happens is if you add a column, that's an excuse to increase your whip limit. If you add additional boards, that's an excuse to hide, hide work so that you can't ever see everything at once. Um, and I, I think the, the sort of short answer to that when we're, um, when we're in person, do it on physical boards, right? It's a lot harder to hide things if we're on physical boards. Um, and if you, as long as we're not in person, as long as we're using these virtual boards, because that's gonna, that's probably gonna be our life for quite a while. If you're in one of these tools, then I, I would recommend you limit the number of boards that you have because there's, there's, it's, it's too easy to hide things. Um, if you don't need multiple boards in order to visualize something that is really important to you, and by the time you have that need, you're likely not not trying to hide things anymore. Um, but if you don't have that need, just try to come up with a workflow that that supports all of your work. That's my answer. I don't know. Mike might have a different answer. Yeah, well, it, it's tough in a tool like this because you really can't see all the things. If if your environment had, for example, licenses for Miro and the uh, the Jira plugin you could absolutely lay out a really complex workflow on your mural board and have it backed by Jira. Not all clients do that sort of thing. So um, what about the idea of having work flow through that doesn't flow through every state? Like what if I had a piece of work, for example, that in your column here could go from A to C? Does, does, does Kanban prevent me from doing that? Because it's like my workflow is A, B, C. No, as long on. as your policies call it out, then it's totally legal. So if your policy says bugs, for example, can skip column B, then that's cool. Bugs skip column B. Yeah, it, it, just to call this out, if you ever ask the question, does Kanban allow that? Um, the answer almost always is, what do your policies say? Almost every time. Um, aside from these three core practices that we just talked through, Almost every time the answer is, what is your, what do your policies say? And if the question is ever, not that this would ever show up on an exam anywhere, but if the question were ever, does Kanban forbid, the almost, answer is almost always no. It does not forbid almost anything. Hey, Mike, if we could go back to Ken's question for a minute. I wonder if you wouldn't... Um explain that water level slide that you skipped over because that was a, that's a really good way of thinking about um finding bottlenecks and things okay so toyota has this metaphor that they call lowering the water level so if you can imagine for a moment a stream running along with it's got rocks at the bottom but the water seems to be moving along fairly smoothly across the top it looks like all the water is getting to its destination as quickly as possible and everything is, is flowing smoothly but you have this nagging thought that there must be rocks at the bottom slowing it down so what if you lowered the water level not all the way but what if you lowered it to just above where the rocks are now all of a sudden you would see the impact of the obstacles, the rocks in the, the water. You'd start to see whirlpools and eddies showing up in the surface. You might see water being pushed up and over the rocks. We've all seen this sort of thing. And if we lower the water level again to below the rocks, now the rocks are obvious and it's easy to pick them up and pull them out. Well, in this metaphor, the water level is your work in progress. So if you're not sure where to find bottlenecks in your system, lower the amount of work in progress you have. If you had 20 items in progress, lower it to 15. If you had 15, lower it to 10. Keep lowering it and all of a sudden the obstacles will become really apparent. It'll be impossible to miss them and now you'll be able to fix it. I love that, thanks. And just if I could do a quick shameless plug, I just put a URL in your chat that that, well, a nice video of that with pictures of streams, videos of streams uh, is up there along with several other topics that we've talked about tonight. So if you're interested, the URL is in the chat, improvingflow.com.
So I know Mike has a another call at 730 and is going to have to drop off. So I just wanted to uh, throw out a thank you to Mike uh, for joining us and for doing this when he had such a busy day. And I really appreciate it. Um, so thank you, Mike. Um, I'm going to stick around for a while. I'm sure that Mike might stick around for another couple minutes before he has to drop. But um, just wanted to make sure that we got that thank you out there. So thank you. Thank you. I know Thanks, it's Mike. been a bit of a whirlwind. I was talking fast through all that, but hopefully it was helpful. So can we go back to that um, workflow diagram? Yep. If I can find it. Uh, it's up in the beginning there. This one? So, yep, the expedite. Let me I just have a question on this. Can we expedite can be any work item. Is it because we went over one of our work limits, the work in process process? Or is it work that we are expediting that needs to get done immediately? Yes, it's the latter. We have decided that for whatever reason, this work item is more important. So we've given it a boost in priority. We've put it okay. up in the expedited lane in order to make it visually different. And our rule is that we allow the whip limit to be violated by one. So even though the limit is actually four, we've allowed five because there's an expedited bit. So what if we had a limit of three? Would that be expedited still? Not necessarily. So, okay. so the, the goal is, so as, as Mike described earlier, right? If we have expedited work, like the ambulance going down the highway, everything mm -hmm. else has to slow down to make room for it, right? It, it slows everything else in your workflow down. Um, if we can get our work done before it needs to be done, following our standard process, right? So if our SLE, imagine a team where their SLE is two days, right? An, emergen an emergency comes up and the team can ask, ask their manager, ask their product owner, whoever it is that brings the emergency to them. They can say, if we get this done in two days, is that okay? Well, if the answer is yes, then it can just follow their normal process, right? Um, so that's the goal, right? Is to get everything flowing through this team so efficiently, so quickly, that expediting a piece of work doesn't doesn't make a difference, right? It doesn't it doesn't actually make it go any faster because it would be the same thing if they just picked that as their next piece of work. All right, I have another question. Say we took one of those columns. Say we took column C. Does every column have to have a um, whip limit. So there can't be any um, uncontrolled whip on your in, in your system. Um, okay. Between started so, and done. Right. All right. Between started so, and done. So that right. doesn't necessarily mean that the column has to have a whip limit. Um, you could be controlling whip in some other way, right? But there can't be anywhere that work could potentially just pile up in your system between started and done. So Kevin, can I just clarify there? What you're saying is that instead of having six, four, two, and five, I could put 17 and say, I can't have more than 17 items. Across the board. Yes. Across the board. Or another way might be, I can't have more than six gold items, two blue items, and I can't read, see those other colors, Seven. but I can do it by the, whatever those colors of types of works are, right? Like I can mm -hmm. control my whip that way. Yep. Yes. Okay. Now, the gotcha so, there is although Kanban totally allows that, most systems like Jira don't. Jira only allows you to do whip limits by columns. That's the only way it knows. So if you wanted to do it any other way, then you and your team would have to be manually tracking it and not okay. letting the tool do it, which is still possible, but it's more work for you. All right. So let me give you an example, and it's a real example of our board. Our, let, our column C is like ready for production. Mm -hmm. So we build things up over two week period of time that is getting ready for production. But we don't know that number ready for production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that column right now, we have no whip. No whip it's limit. Not, it's not your team's work though, probably, right? Well, it is. It is. Okay. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. The, so, 
production is done, right? It should be in New Mexico. Well, no, it's ready, ready for, for production. production. It's it's waiting out there to be for the next deployment. I think you said the key word there, Elaine. It's waiting. Yes. How do we make it visible that our work is waiting and we can't get it done for some reason? Well, because we have set deployments every two weeks. So we don't do it because our deployment takes a long process. It takes us two week period to deploy things. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that we can reduce that maybe? So, so the the risk there, the reason that we want to limit limit whip there is because we're taking this risk that 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 stuff that we did isn't going to be valuable, right? Um, maybe we're going to deploy it and we're going to find that we've got all kinds of issues in the code um, that we couldn't have found until production. Maybe and anything could happen still with that work, and it could ruin our efficiency, ruin our predictability, ruin our effectiveness. Um, so we have to control that so that so that we can um prevent work from building up there and the what you're calling out are real issues right there there's there's this process there's a step in our process that slows us down that significantly slows us down that puts our predictability at risk that puts all of this stuff at risk how do we improve that right yeah. and you're, you're you're calling out very real issues and unfortunately kanban doesn't tell you how to fix them right <laughs> Um, it just gives you a framework for making them more visible. That's awesome. It sounds, it sounds to me like this would be an interest. Sorry, Brian, you no, were going to say something. I was just going to say, it sounds to me like an interesting future topic, Kevin, would be something around the theory of constraints, because it sounds like Elaine is dealing with a, a real constraint that's mm -hmm. preventing something from going through. And I, I, you know, I know I experienced that, and I'm sure all of us do, but that would be an interesting topic maybe to dive into the theory of constraints and, and how to exploit that constraint. Well, but the, the problem with that scenario is the cycle time for every item is always two weeks. So you're not really measuring anything, are you? It does kind of skew everything, you're right. Well, it doesn't skew anything. The reality is that you're adding two weeks potentially to the delivery of your work, of your value. And that right. is value that you need to optimize, I guess, right, Kevin? Exactly, right? We, we, maybe we're okay with that, right? Maybe we're okay with an additional two weeks in our process. And we're okay with the additional risk that that provides. But we have to accept that that's the reality of our situation. Right. Um, that that is really what is happening. The part that makes this make a lot more sense to me in the Kanban context is what if like two or three months worth of releases sat there in that last column all of a sudden that deployment that you eventually get around to doing once a quarter is at tremendous risk because of all the potential conflicts and issues and trying to push so much stuff out at once i don't know if you guys have done big bang releases like that before but there's usually a lot more risk that comes with that so iterative thinking get more stuff out sooner right yep yeah but the but the time it takes us to um get things developed and get things out into um, testing and then also um, into our cert environment and then deployment, it's, a, it's about a two week cycle period. So it seems to me that something like this, Elaine, would help make that visible and transparent so that we could then have a conversation of, to Kevin's point, what do we wanna do about it? Are we happy? Are we, ex is, is that as good as we can be? Or do we want to do something about it? And I, I, I don't know. I think that might be a neat bit of data and I, a neat visualization to have. It's, it's, it's almost like Kanban isn't going to make us better. It's just going to expose things that we can then have meaningful conversations because we'll have the data oh. on. Yeah, there, there's a, an idea that I, I often sort of, talk about with teams and that's that we we don't want to make the data better right we're not trying to improve metrics what we're trying to improve is our delivery of values the effectiveness of our process and if if we um 
if we change things by, say, for example, saying that um, before we, that when we get something to ready for prod, we call that done. That's, that's making our metrics vanity metrics and improve and, and trying to improve just those vanity metrics rather than improving the, the reality of our delivery. Um, the customer experience. And the, yeah, what, what is our customer's experience with our team, right? Um, I don't, I don't care. I, I don't have a, a bar that I say metrics must be at this level. What, what I hope for from teams is that they're having conversations about where, about how their workflow is operating today and where they want to improve it. 